Hello, everyone, and welcome to 10 Years On, the Future of Organizing in the MENA Region. My name is May Sabeni, and I'm the Managing Director and the Legal and Judicial Director at the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy. Today's moderated discussion will be the last in a series of events we've been hosting as part of 10 Years On, Organizing in the MENA Region a project that the Institute launched in December of last year to create a platform around the anniversary of the region's 2010 and 2011 protests for those who have organized, are organizing, and will organize in the MENA region. In bringing this project to a close, we opted to focus on the countries who faced more recent waves of protests in the last decade. Today, we look to Algeria, Sudan, Lebanon, and Iraq, we're hearing from a remarkable group of experts who will reflect on how these movements have unfolded on the ground, but also the roles that the online space and diaspora communities have played in complementary. Together, we'll see and we'll ask what these more recent mobilizations can tell us about, about the future of mobilizing in the region writ large. Please do join the conversation and share your reflections. Tweet about today's conversation using the hashtag 10 years on. It is my pleasure to host to, and welcome today's moderator for the event, the wonderful Zahra Hanker. Zahra is a Lebanese journalist who writes about the communities and cultures of the Middle East. She is the editor of Our Women on the Ground, essays by Arab women reporting from the Arab world. Her next book about the cultural history of eyeliner will be forthcoming from Penguin in 2023. She holds a degree in journalism from Columbia University. Zahra, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really excited in particular because these are countries that are not often associated with the so-called Arab Spring and that have witnessed a lot of movement um, in the past few years. So I'm, I'm really loving the, um, the selection of countries and also our distinguished guests as well. I just wanted to remind everybody that you can ask the panelists questions. We definitely welcome as many questions as possible and you can ask the questions from now. You don't have to wait until we actually start the Q&A um, section of the discussion today. So for logistics, uh, also to let you know that we are recording this event and that for the first 45 minutes, our panelists will be speaking and then we will um, shift over to the Q&A section. So without further ado, to start, uh, we're going to introduce Ines Osman. Ines is a French Algerian human rights lawyer and the co-founder and director of MENA Rights Group, which is a legal advocacy NGO, which defends and promotes fundamental rights and freedoms in the Middle East and North Africa region. Prior to that, she worked as a human rights practitioner for several years in, inter in international courts and human rights NGOs. She's joining us today from France. Um, hi, Ina. So nice to see you and to meet you. I've been following your work online. Um, I'd like to start a little bit with kind of an overview of what's been happening over the past two years, in particular from 2019 through now, in particular the Hirak movement, and what your um, sort of analysis is of the specificity of the movement. Uh, you've mentioned before that the movement um, may have caught people by surprise, so I'd love for you to get into the details of that. Sure. Thanks a lot, Zahra, and thank you to Time Up for convening this event. Um, so just to give a little bit of background, um, I like to call Algeria the late bloomer of the so-called Arab Spring, because obviously when the protest movement started in 2011, um, not much happened in Algeria, or at least it didn't seem like it. Um, but I want to highlight that there were some protests starting in 2010 and 2011 that were sparked by increase in uh, basic food prices, unemployment, um, lack of housing, and so on and so forth. Um, and so there was some sort of protest movement happening. The problem is that um, it was put to a stop for a number of reasons, including the fact that it was met with strong police presence and excessive violence. There were over um, 100 protesters who were arrested. And also to appease um, tensions in 2011, the authorities took a number of measures. They lifted the state of emergency, which had been in place since 1992. Um, and most importantly, and that's something the Algerian authorities have been doing for a very, very long time, thanks to um, the significant oil and gas rent, um, is to release a 20 billion euros 
um, check basically in support of a number of social and economic measures um, to basically buy social peace and maintain the political status quo. And after that, basically, it was um, quiet and eight years um, fast forward um, on 22nd, on the 22nd of February 2019, that's when the Iraq was born. And basically, it happened um, a few days after the president announced that he was running for a fifth term uh, and announced his candidacy and mass protest erupted throughout the country because the president had been ill for a very long time and people were chanting we don't have a president we just have a poster like a photo of the president because effectively he hadn't been seen in public for a while and it really felt like almost a humiliation uh, that this guy was yet again running for for another term so that's how the protest movement um started and he quickly resigned in early April. However, um, the movement continued despite that and people were demanding the departure of the entire um, ruling class and like a deep reform of the system. So as you said, it was, I think, unexpected for people in Algeria, but it was also very unexpected, I think, for the ruling class. And despite the setbacks, and I'm sure we'll we'll get back to that later on, um, you know, as to where the movement is today, the street really brought a number of very high ranking officials to their knees. And that's something incredible and probably like one of the biggest takeaways um, of the movement today is that the, the power in place was terrified of the streets. And for the first time, it felt like fear sort of change sides and that feelings of political paralysis were um, swept away. Um, so the movement was massive. There were um, millions of people from all over the territory, from all generations, and these were actually the biggest protests since uh, the independence from France. Um, so the movement was really um, huge in terms of numbers. And then in terms of um, the, the demands of the people, for the first time, they were only solely political. Before, they used to be more directed towards um, social and economic issues, but this time it was really about the, um, the political uh, situation. What was also um, quite specific to the movement is that it was very loose. There was no leadership. It was not organized by opposition parties or it was not in support of, let's say, one political opponent that would represent like an alternative um, potential leader, so to say. Um, and last but not least, um, the protests have been extremely peaceful. Uh, and that's why we sometimes speak of the Algerian protests as the revolution of smiles. Um, and that's also extremely important because, Al because Algeria went through a civil war in the 90s that left uh, 200,000 people dead. So that's also something huge in the history because I think people were also scared that for, that you know it could lead um, to to violence. And that's also something that the authorities had been using for a very long time whenever there were some sort of protest movement emerging to say like oh if you take the streets actually we're gonna we're gonna fall back into into violence and one thing that i want to highlight on that is that at the very beginning of the protest movement uh the prime minister made a statement because there was a photo that went viral of protesters handing over roses to police officers and the prime minister was asked to comment on the photo and he said, well, you know what, that's great. Uh, but the Syrian revolution also started with roses, um, which is kind of offensive to the Syrian people, first of all. But it, it's also to say like how heavy that narrative was to basically try to scare people and say, if you go to the streets, we're going to have a civil, yet another civil war. Thank you so much, Ines. That's a fascinating overview. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, how you've actually once said that this movement hasn't really translated into an organized movement per se. Do you think that that might have to do with some of the scare tactics that you've just mentioned now, or are there other fundamental issues? 
I think one of the reasons that it was not um, sort of organized and was quite loose, which I think is a good thing, but it also has to do with the fact that we've basically had the same regime in place since 1962, um, pretty much. So there was also really a political void, and I don't think there would have been any other like alternative political forces that would have stepped in and say, okay, we are the alternative, here is what we propose. So I think there was basically no other way that this movement um, could have been. Obviously, it comes with um, some issues in terms of what's going to come next, because um, the issue with having no leadership is that you also need a more structured movement to talk to the regime in place. Um, and without traditional, let's say, political actors that would take part in a political electoral process, then it leaves the question of what's next. And one example of that is that initially the presidential elections were supposed to take place in July 2019 because the authorities tried to say like, okay, okay, we're going to get a new president, everything is going to be fine, don't worry. And ultimately, like, we had no candidates. And that's because you can't possibly, you know, in, in so little time have the opportunity to, for like political, let's say, or civil society leaders to emerge because that was coming from decades of of political void as i as i mentioned so yeah it kind of ties into the question of what now and what's our alternative to the current regime um in place basically great very briefly and i think this is going to be a theme that will come up with everybody really on the panel today is you know there are challenges in in mobilization today and if you could sort of outline what you believe the, the biggest challenges are. And, you know, also there's um, a crackdown on journalists, and this is also across the region. I think just this week, there was an Algerian journalist who was um, sentenced to a year in prison, Nouradine Tunsi, um, who'd, who'd used social media um, to report on alleged wrongdoings at the port of Iran. So I'm, I'm sort of curious from your perspective as to what the biggest challenges are and even utilizing social media can be problematic in this context as well. Absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> the first thing to, to state is that two years on, like there has been no real political change and that's very clear. And the leaders that have been prosecuted and imprisoned were kind of the scapegoats. Um, and I think they were, that was also used as a mean to kind of like lessen the streets mobilization. And practically speaking, there has been no change. And on the contrary, we, we've seen a renewed crackdown that we hadn't seen for a very long time. And as you mentioned, the arrest of, of journalists, activists, bloggers, or just like peaceful demonstrators, people writing on Facebook, whatever, that's something that we hadn't seen um, for years. So the, this, the unexpected scale of the Hirak was also met with, you know, an unexpected crackdown, and I think people didn't think that the authorities um, would go would go this far. Another component is the role of the army, which is kind of the backbone of the Algerian state, and I think a lot of people are also like, okay, like whatever political alternatives are are brought to us, are presented to us, they're all backed and sort of pre-approved by the army. So that's also like another another issue in terms of, you know, the, the next um, the next steps. And then I think today in relation also to the crackdown against like peaceful dissidents and, and prisoners of conscience is the lack of independence of the judiciary. And it really ties into really the whole institutional system um, and just to give you an example, everybody has heard of the case of Khaled Ranini, who was uh, a journalist and correspondent with Reporters Without Borders in Algeria, who was arrested and sentenced to prison. And he was um, recently released. But actually, if you look a bit closer, even his release has no legal basis because he was not subject to an amnesty. You can't get an amnesty unless all judicial proceedings have been exhausted. And he's, and he's in, sorry, in his case, he had to 
um, undergo still an appeal before the court of cassation. But basically my point is that the decision to release him technically was just a decision from the executive that legally at the judicial level had no legal basis. So it shows you it shows you that even in when positive things happen, it still means that we're basically left to the arbitrariness of, of the judiciary and executive decisions to release certain prisoners or not. So that's that's a big problem that um, that we still face today. Thank you, and there's so many challenges there. I'm sure we'll come up, um, we'll come back to some of those challenges. Um, moving on to Ismail, um, Ismail Kushkush. Um, he is a journalist and a uh, global reporting center contributor. He's written for the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Atlantic, the Smithsonian, the Nation, Guernica, and many, many others. Uh, he was based in Khartoum, Sudan for eight years and for two separate three month periods. He was the acting bureau chief for the New York Times in East Africa, based in Nairobi. Uh, welcome, Ismail, really good to see you today. Um, I wonder if you could talk to us, hello. I wonder if you could talk to us about Sudan. You've mentioned that Sudan is a country in transition, locally, regionally, and internationally. And there are so many different dynamics there, but perhaps you can give us a little bit of an over, overview before we go into some specifics. Sure. So the, the protests of late 2018 and 20, early 2019, you know, what we call, oh, some observers are calling the second wave of, of the Arab Spring, um, if you want to use that term, um, represent a continuation of protests that have been going on since uh, 2011. Um, I was in Khartoum in, in 2011 when protests uh, started on January 30th, you know, five days after the you know, protests uh, started in Cairo and, and after Tunisia, uh, that were inspired by what was happening in, in the region. Uh, they were crushed immediately in two weeks. Um, and then you had protests also in 2012 and 2013 for different reasons, uh, depending on who was organizing, how they were able uh, or not able to reach the, the masses. Um, they succeeded, they succeeded or did not succeed. Um, in 2018, I think all the, the right ingredients um, came into place uh, to make the four month period of protest, um, what now people are calling the Sudanese revolution of, of 2019 to come into place. So the economic situation uh, was, was incredibly dire with um, inflation reaching 70%. Uh, the president talking about, uh, the, the former president Omar al-Bashir uh, talking about uh, running again in 2020, uh, he came to power in 1989. Uh, this sort of extended his his uh, uh, power for many more years. Um, the activists themselves that had been calling for protest, I think, also uh, changed their modes of organizing. Uh, greater attention to cybersecurity, um, the ability to connect uh, to um, uh, many many of the young activists represent represented the uh, various political themes, political groupings in, in Sudan. I think there was greater coordination this time uh, between different groups, uh, different young activists. Um, who are no longer waiting for the political parties, the traditional political parties and, and the opposition that for, for the longest time re represented uh, the modes of political change, the modes of, of expressing political discontent along with, with the armed groups in certain re different regions and that for in the Nuba Mountains and Blue Niles, etc. Uh, so it was very telling to see that the first major protest actually came from outside of Khartoum. Uh, normally it's the educated elite of Khartoum that have, have led the political consciousness uh, and political expressions of political discontent in the country in 20, late 2018, December 2018, uh, the first major protest started in the very north of Sudan in the town of Adbara, also in the town of Demazin in southeast Sudan, uh, then came to Khartoum. Uh, this is very different from the history of, of political uh, expressions of political discontent in the country. Um, they were better organized. Um, I think one very important uh, 
form of organizing was the, the creation of the SPA, the Sudanese Professionals Association, uh, which was a, 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 a reinvention of, of, of the role of uh, professional syndicates in Sudan. You know, historically, since the 60s, uh, professional syndicates, professional uh, groups, uh, such as lawyers and doctors and journalists, um, have played an important role in Sudanese political life. The, the uh, recreation of a non-government associated uh, professionals association, I think, uh, attracted many in, in, uh, on the ground, uh, seeing that there was no direct political affiliation. I mean, given Sudan's own political history, uh, long political history of, of, of uh, nonviolent political protests, you know, starting in 1964, October Revolution, really the first major nonviolent uh, uprising in, in the region, the April uh, 1985 uprising in Tifada de Bril, um, also. The, the, so the role of syndicates was important in the 2019 um, uh, revolution. Uh, so given all of that, um, I think we, we saw uh, better organizing, uh, better usage of, uh, of, of internet organizing. Um, it was very interesting to see how WhatsApp and Twitter uh, specifically played a much bigger role than compared to 2012 or 2013. The diaspora's role uh, in, in terms of connecting to international media, in terms of lobbying governments in, in Washington and London uh, to pay greater attention to what was happening uh, in Sudan. Uh, the economic situation became so dire that, you know, even those um, um, were reluctant to join protests for years. Um, I think one thing that the, the Bashir government uh, had been uh, succeeded in is in for, for some period, um, the economic situation, you know, this was bad, but it was not as bad, say, as the 80s, uh, where, you know, the prices of bread were incredibly high. But this time, it, the situation was just so bad that it was, it, um, it was very difficult for people not to uh, be critical. Um, uh, I mean, interestingly, even the sons and daughters of members of the ruling party, the NCP, the National Congress Party, joined the protest. Uh, um, against um, you know the authoritarianism of, of, of the government of, of the um, of just the bad uh, economic uh, situation, so that I think uh, played a major role in in terms of how um, it, it was organized, um, and also um, just the, the regional alliances. I think people uh, looking at uh, where people fell into regional uh, alliances, I think, uh, started to, to uh, play a, a, a important role. I mean, for many journalists who have, have covered protests in, in Sudan, you know, going back to 2011, 12, and 13, I think many of us were a bit skeptical in, in the very beginning. Um, but I think a week or two into the uh, 2018, 2019 protest, you know, it was clear that this was very different, that this actually might. Uh, result in, in, in something. Um, April 6, 2019, when the uh, protesters marched to the um, square uh, right in front of the army headquarters and were able to establish a sit-in, I think for many of us that was a signal that something completely is, it has changed, that this is a game changer. Um, that, the, uh, that the army not interfering in breaking up that sit-in uh, clearly behind the scenes that there were negotiations to um, have Bashir removed. And I think that's what really uh, made for, for this, uh, for the, the 2019 Sudanese revolution um, to succeed. In, and at least in that part, in, in, in uh, bringing down uh, Bashir's government and forcing negotiations with, with civil groups. Great, thank you for that very, very comprehensive um, overview, Ismail. Um, I'd love it if you could talk a little bit um, about identity uh, and how that has factored in. I mean, you you mentioned yourself, you know, if we could call this the Arab Spring, just the idea of identity in Sudan when it comes to mobilizing. And then also the um, the normalization of the relationship with Israel as well and how that's factored in too, because that may have complicated matters. Sure. So, I mean, the, the, the term Arab Spring, which I mean, I personally don't mind, but, but I do know many in Sudan who will, will um, have, uh, be reluctant. I mean, as in other places, as in Algeria and, you know, even in 
some parts of Iraq, that that the the, the whole term um, has has uh, um, the, the, the reservations. I mean, because identity in Sudan is is an issue, and you know, uh, a country that is multi-ethnic, that is uh, diverse. Uh, where does diversity play? Uh, uh, what, where is the place of diversity in the in the revolution? Um, and you know, are do you know? Where, how do Sudanese relate to um, the rest of the Arab world? I mean, the, these are questions that um, have been brought out by by the revolution. Not only that, but also internally. You know, um, what kind of cultural policies? What kind of educational policies? Uh, especially, you know, in, in the regions of Sudan that uh, Arabic is not the dominant language, or um, when um, gross uh, inequalities, political, social, cultural, economic inequalities intersect with uh, ethnic and, and, and regional identities. You know, so th these are some of the issues that have been uh, brought up. I mean, there, there have been even calls by some of the protesters uh, uh, you know, to withdraw from the Arab League, uh, to, uh, you know, I mean, and this is not, I mean, there, there are many opinions on this, but, but I mean, th these are some of the voices that, that, that did come. You know, one of the interesting things was at the sit-in in front of the army headquarters is that these discussions, I think, uh, for the very first time became very public in Sudan. Even today on Sudanese TV, you see discussions about identity that, you know, in the past would have been uh, difficult to see. Um, you know, uh, the broadcasting of songs in uh, languages other than Arabic, you know, that 40 or Nubian, or Bija, you know, these these are these are I think some of the products of, of the revolution. So this this is one one side of it. In in terms of the, the transition and uh, the uh, normalizing with Israel, um, I think the, the question of normalization with Israel really in the in the region is uh, a a topic that more and more is becoming less of a a, a, a taboo. Um, that it is that the, the fact is that there, people have different opinions on this topic, um, and uh, uh, while specifically on the case of Sudan, I think it had more to do with uh, regional and international politics. The very fact that the announcement came from Washington D.C. by President Trump uh, and with Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, um, a, a topic that I think that had more to do with U.S. elections, uh, with Trump trying to uh, show some sort of uh, foreign policy success, Benjamin Netanyahu's efforts to also uh, cater to uh, his his election efforts, um, and and also the idea of uh, finding uh, ways to expel the uh, close to six thousand Sudanese asylum seekers uh, in Israel. Um, I think that that has been a part of it, but also I mean, if we look at the uh, transitional government in Sudan, that is um, made of two components: the uh, civilians and then the military, uh, and where they fall and who are the regional allies. I think uh, uh, at the end of the day, um, that decision uh, it was you know it was very interesting to see that the prime minister say one thing that you know whether or not Sudan establishes relations with Israel is something that should be left to an elected parliament, which still we don't, uh, there is no elected parliament yet in, 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 uh, in the country. Um, it's, a, it's supposed to be a part of the transition uh, that hasn't happened yet. Uh, and then the announcement um, of this uh, normalizing with, with Israel, um, uh, the, the military side of the transitional government uh, clearly having a, uh, a big role with that, with, with uh, the, the head of the, uh, the, the sovereign council, Burhan, meeting with Netanyahu in Uganda even months before that. Uh, it, it tells you something about the internal politics of the transition itself. Um, but also the mood in Sudan, um, as far as um, you know, uh, the, the relationship with with neighboring countries, uh, and then uh, uh, here um, is that um, the Sudanese economy for 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 you for years, but especially this past couple of years, um, has has been suffering, and one of the reasons is the lack of foreign uh, investment. 
And uh, a major reason for that was the uh, Sudan's listing as part of a start, state sponsor of terrorism. Uh, in order um, to have Sudan delisted from that list, um, it was seen that normalizing with Israel was, was something that um, the transitional government was pressured in, into, uh, whether it came from uh, the US or from uh, regional powers. So uh, that's, that has been a part of the, uh, the, the, the transition and the complexity of the transition to Sudan today. Indeed, extremely complex. Thank you so much, Ismail, for talking us through so many of those dynamics. Um, we're going to move on to Lebanon and Eileen uh, Flehan now. Uh, I've, I've said this to Eileen before, but I'm Lebanese myself, so I have so many questions that I would love to ask. But just to introduce her, um, Eileen has eight years of experience in architecture and urban planning at various local and regional enterprises. She currently works for the municipality of Ras al Khaimah, United Arab Emirates, as an urban planner. Along with her professional career, she's a social and political activist, and she has been since 2011. Currently, she's a member of a grassroots political movement that's committed to the people and their rights and to participatory democracy as an organizational and political approach. She is runner, running for the Representative Council's elections at the Order of Engineers and Architects in Beirut. Hi, Eileen. Um, so Hello. good to have, Hi, you, to have you on board. Hello, and so relieved that the internet connection is going well so far from Beirut. Um, I'd love it if you could talk yes, to us. Uh, and, yeah, sorry, sorry, go on. I want to thank you for uh, for organizing this uh, panel. Thank you. Thanks so much. I'd love it if you could talk about, um, I mean, obviously the, the past 10 years in Lebanon have been incredibly um, difficult and looking at the economic situation, not just the economic situation, the humanitarian situation in the country, uh, we see that it's, it's um, essentially crumbling before our very eyes. Um, and I would love it if you could talk to us about the difficulties of mobilizing in such a context, and particularly after the Beirut blast of 2020, and how tools have changed over the years, given especially that you have direct experience with tools and, and mobilization in Lebanon. Um, okay, uh, so basically, um, as, uh, as Ismail and Inas talked, uh, it's, it's a bit similar here in Lebanon, but the challenges are, are way, uh, especially now the socioeconomic uh, crisis that we're having, especially uh, the blast in Beirut. Um, so yeah, uh, what, I, uh, what I can sum up is that uh, it's all like, uh, it's all like it started with the phase that uh, uh, it all was in the previous phase that uh, resulted in a social division on a sectarian, a sectarian basis. So basically everything before 2011, the division was vertical uh, on a sectarian uh, identity. It was a vertical polarization. And then when it started in 2011, the anti-establishment movement, it started uh, the, the division, it was like changing and it became a, a little more between the people and the establishment. So, uh, and then... Uh, um, it looks like we may have lost Eileen. I, I may have jinxed it by saying the internet connection was, <laughs> was going well. Um, what I can do is we can move on to you, Mustafa, and then come back to Aline if she um, if she comes back to us in, in the next two, three minutes. Sorry, everybody, and thank you for bearing with us here. Um, hi, Mustafa. <laughs> Mustafa is a Washington Post foreign reporter based in Iraq, and he's Excuse been me. covering. Sorry, oh, are you, are you back, Aline? OK. Hello? Yes. Great. Okay, we can't see you. So Mustafa, we will come back to you after Aline. We can't see you, so maybe if you okay, sorry. There, you're back. Sorry. Can you, you hear me at least? Out. Yes, please go on, Aline. I wasn't sure if you'd come back to us. Okay. I'm glad that you're you're here. Yes. Please go on. So yeah, what I was like basically telling you that the the that the division in Lebanon before 2011 was a vertical. It was between sectarian groups that was established after the Ta'if uh, uh, Ta agreement, which was in, after the, the, the civil war. Uh, but after the 2011 anti-establishment movements, uh, the, the narrative was was a bit different, and the division we come to uh, was also yeah. It was like it, it became more between the establishment versus the people, so it became more horizontal. 
the establishment versus the people. And then in 2013, we faced the un uh, unconstitutional term uh, extension of the parliament, which also resulted in more uh, corruption and no progress on the political and economical uh, uh, level, which also uh, uh, reflected on, in the crisis of the garbage in 2015. That was uh, that initiated the Use Think movement, which I think in 2019 we really learned a lot of lessons and tools from that uh, movement, 2015, because it was uh, it was uh, I, I I think in 2011 the the movement was not spontaneous because it was like affected by what was happening in the region, but but in 2015 it was like more. Uh, more spontaneous but the problem is that it was not nationwide it was only centralized in beirut and uh, and uh, uh, that uh, the, nothing was achieved on the political level and uh, the the, the uh, nothing was uh, sorry okay we seem to have lost Eileen again but i'd like it if we just give her a minute hopefully she'll be back with us shortly thank you everybody for your patience and apologies mustafa because i started introducing you and then stopped introducing you but we will definitely come back to you i'm just monitoring to see when she comes back on this is typical for um people who are participating from lebanon not the first time it's happened in panels that i've moderated <laughs> Okay, we will give it, we will give it a f another minute and then move on to Mustafa um, if she's not back. Looks like she's back. Hi, Aline. Hello. Hi, welcome back, Aline. Okay, sorry, it's what my bad. Uh, yes, so uh, what I want to talk about now is now in the 2019, the tools that uh, that changed. So basically what we learned from 2015 is that we need to be more organized since uh, uh, basically in 2015 everything was like social media and it was and we and we had like political activists that were leading the streets. So in 2019 the tools really changed and uh, and uh, basically it was because of the uh, uh, the, the socio-economic uh, the, the socio-economic situation that happened uh, uh, because the, the, uh, uh, Lebanon was the, there was a fiscal crisis that started after the parliamentary elections in 2018. And a lot of reforms were uh, were requested from uh, because the the, the Lebanese uh, uh, cabinets were asking for funds to help Lebanon. And one of the requirements were reform and the parliamentary election that was ha that happened 2018. And no reforms were done except on the budget that they did, which was like uh, 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 in 2019 they issued a budget that was uh, uh, they they had to uh, to to do the budget on uh, the taxes were were crazy and they did a tax on what's up and this was what triggered the, the protest in 2019 so uh, in 2019 uh, october 2019 it was very decentralized and it, it was very spontaneous it happened in all lebanon and this is what was a threat for the for the establishment because uh, uh, every group in, in each area uh, uh, revolted on its sectarian its own sectarian leader and uh, it, and here where the repression started and the brutal uh, uh, repression started from the from the establishment uh, also it was very remarkable uh, the 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 level of awareness we had in 2019 and in, in the narrative and now we are being very well organized and i am in, in a political organization and i am organized i'm also running for election because we learned that in 2015 we need to be more organized so uh, uh, Zahra, sorry, I'm all, I'm constantly having this message up from this, uh, and when I'm text, I'm I'm pressing it. Uh, it's it's disconnecting. Okay, that's that's okay, Adin. How about I ask you a question? Um, although I think she might. No, she's still. You're still here, Adin. You're just frozen. Um. Okay, we may need to come back to to Aline when she comes back on the call. I will suggest that um, we wait until after Mustafa speaks. So Mustafa, if you if you're you're ready, um, Mustafa, 
is a journalist with the Washington Post in Baghdad, um, and he's been covering the protest movement closely in Baghdad. And um, I'd love it if you could uh, perhaps talk to us about the situation there on the ground. You have been covering Iraqi news for the Washington Post for the last seven years, so you've witnessed um, you know, th many dynamics uh, over the years. And if you want to talk perhaps about the phases that the Iraqi protests have gone through for more than a year since October 2019, that would be wonderful, Mustafa. Hello, everyone. Uh, to go a little way back, I mean, the first uh, protest movement in, in, in Iraq took They started to uh, mobilize and gathering each Friday on Tahrir Square in the central of Baghdad. It was faced with brutal uh, violence by the Iraqi government back then, which led uh, to be uh, finished very soon. They have kidnapped and killed many activists and Iraqi journalists back then. And the thing is, uh, in 2011, their demand was not to overthrow the government. Their slogan was they want to fix the system. It was the first demonstrations in, uh, in Iraq after 03, uh, after a bloody sectarian war that the country went through, and uh, the country has just defeated Al-Qaeda, and the US forces has just left the country, so it was the first uh, phase of having a peacetime, and their, their most demand was services and electricity, and job opportunities. They didn't uh, demand to change the system because it was an elected government, an elected parliament. Uh, but then in 2013, uh, demonstration in the Sunni provinces, which was mainly for uh, political uh, purposes. It was a, as a reaction of the sectarian policy that taking place by the Shia government, by the Prime Minister Nuri al-Maliki, when he tried to sack his uh, people who were against him in the government, uh, like the, the uh, Vice President and the uh, Finance Ministry, who were both Sunnis, one from Anbar and one from Baghdad, who are representing the main Sunni politicians uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the capital. They mobilized their supporters and they started demanding to uh, stop the sectarian tension between the uh, politicians in the country and they demanded that the Shia government should treat the Sunni provinces with, with justice. But that uh, took another road and eventually led to the rise of the Islamic State in the country and they have took over Fallujah city in the end on, on 2013. Then the country became, became in a state of war until uh, 2017 or 2018, it was all over and the, the country has returned back to civility again. At least there was no war. And to 2019, uh, the Iraqi uh, people for the first time started a spontaneous calls for demonstration and also this time it was mainly as well for like job opportunities services electricity and what sparked it was the uh, prime minister Adel Abdel Mahdi sacked a senior well-known Iraqi general who was the, the the main general who led the war against ISIS in Mosul and other provinces so at the beginning on the 1st of October 2019, it was a spontaneous demonstration, was mainly for the people to get their right, their, uh, their job opportunities, and also demanding to return back this general. It was faced with brutal and uh, violence and snipers from day one. Uh, main, the main people who were uh, particip participating in these demonstrations were the sh poor Shia people, mainly from the southern city. I remember as a, as a journalist, I was like, uh, like standing on the road between Tahrir Square and Sadr City and see the people coming from that direction. Sadrists uh, all over time were the main people who were the fuel of any demonstration in the capital city of Baghdad. Mutal Sadr was known of, he was the, the most one who can control the supporters. Once he tells them to go to the streets, they would go like hundreds of thousands of them as well as when, once he tell them to, to return back. In 2015, uh, the one, one of the most significant demonstrations that he called for, it led, first of all, as a sit-in around the Green Zone, all by Sadrists. They set up their tents, and they were uh, putting a sit around the Green Zone, and then should they storm the Green Zone and storm their government. But this demonstration was mostly political demonstration. Uh, it was, they were used by 
uh, their politicians, the federal politicians, once they get what they want within the position of the government, then they send them back home. The 2019 was different, even though most of the people were from the federal city, but they were not Southerners, as politici uh, politician term. They, they went to demand their rights uh, uh, according to what they were, they were saying. They were faced from day one by, by snipers uh, and by live shots. They even stormed the hospitals to arrest those who were injured during the demonstration. Uh, the militias attacked uh, TV stations like Al Arabi Al Hadath, and RT, uh, other news agencies. Uh, they destroyed their equipment, they arrested a few people of them which led many of us, we fled to Erbil last year, I remember, Erbil, the KRG where it, uh, it was stable. Uh, at that time, it was paused for a little while because of the uh, uh, Alpain pilgrimage of the Shia people to, uh, to Karbala. Uh, it was, there was, they were calls to resume on the 25th of October. Uh, it, it, it happened as, like a year or less than a year after Adel, Adel Mahdi received the prime minister post. And Adil Abdel Mahdi was the prime minister who opened the whole gates of the Iraqi state to the Shia militia supported by Iran. He gave them uh, senior positions into his government, the, the one who was uh, running all the affairs into his office. His name was Abu Jihad, and he was known as a uh, senior uh, PMF leader. PMF is Popular Mobilization Forces, an establishment, establishment they have established uh, after 2014, after the fatwa of the Shia Authority of Pakistani. To fight ISIS. Uh, because they've seen it as a threat for the post of Adar al Mahdi, they started to uh, uh, have a media campaign against these demonstrations. So, one of their uh, campaigns, they called anyone who participates in such demonstration uh, someone who's serving the US agenda. They even, like Aysel Khaz Ali, who's the main commander of Asa'ib al Haq, a senior militia leader, he was calling them the American Joker. Also because it was at the same time when the that American movie Joker to, uh, was uh, in the cinemas. I don't know how they linked uh, these things together, but they, as they called them the uh, American Joker. They, so since October, they started to sniping them, uh, attacking the, their tents during the night, kidnapping the protesters, which led also as another reaction by the people. I remember when uh, the 1st of October uh, uh, happened, when Sadr said that they will not participate, uh, I thought that it will not be that big of people. But I was surprised at the reaction of that violence. People from all over the city of Baghdad and other, other provinces participated, each one in their provinces. In Baghdad, there was Tahrir Square. In Nasriya, there was Habubi Square. Uh, each province had its own square. And then people, even though it was spontaneous, it was not organized, but people organizing this themselves, that there were tents, there were free food for anyone who would join, people started to put their own money. People started to buy helmets for the people to participate because they were faced a massive tear gas that they were shot in, right into the face. It wasn't used to crowd control. No, it was used as deadly force. They were shooting the tear gas right into the, the, uh, the heads and the faces. Many, many people died as a result of that tear gas cancer. More than 500 people in total in demonstration died as a result of the deadly cancers and uh, live rounds and snipers. Uh, then, when it became millions of people, actually, in all over the country, started to participate in these demonstrations, many politicians, including the Sadrists, started uh, to try to hijack these demonstrations to get some political gains. That was the main tension that happened between the demonstrations and the Sadrists uh, in the same area of the demonstration area. At the beginning, the main, uh, actually, uh, to be honest, the main one who protected those demonstrations from day one until that tension was were the Sadrists because they were the main force. They were the ones who were protecting the areas. And also, uh, according to the defense minister in the United government, he said there was an order at the beginning to like storm with a deadly force, the uh, demonstration, uh, in order to kick them out all from the buildings that they were controlling, especially the ticket, what was so called Tikrit restaurant, which was a place that was used mostly, mostly by the Iraqi forces because it was overviewed the whole square. So the Iraqi forces, 
they were using that building in order to shoot a tear gas canister all over the square to end the demonstration. What they did with the demonstration, they, they controlled that building first, which made them control all the square. Inside the square, actually, they started to create their own state. There was a tunnel, what's called the Tahrir Tunnel. It was mostly abandoned. They started to paint it. They, they drew lots of uh, paints in that tunnel. They made it really beautiful. The Tiger Reserve Bank, close to Tahrir Square, it was a place filled with garbage and abandoned only because it was uh, the, the green zone was the, other side, was the other side. For security reasons, no one was allowed to go there. And then when the demonstration people, the protesters controlled that area, they made it into actually a nice beach. They made like some volleyballs and they started some activities and cinemas. They they started their own state over there and they were cleaning and they were uh, their demands has transformed from fixing the regime into overthrow all the regime. They wanted to overthrow the whole regime, early elections, change the election law, starting a new system. What's different between the demonstration in 2019 and 2011? Most of the people in 2019 are the new generation. People are in the mid of their 20s. People who were born either in 2023 or after 20, after 20. They were not, they didn't live the same circumstances that the older generation lived. They were not isolated from the world at all. They were people able to travel. People have internet access that they can know, they can educate themselves. And this is why uh, this generation had no red lines. For the first time, uh, since all three of demonstration, they were publicly criticizing Iranian influence in the country, uh, criticizing the Shia authority in the country, criticizing all the religious figures in the country, because since all three, until now actually, was, uh, what we are having is like Islamic system mostly, as a secular system. Sure. And there, was, there were some figures that considered for many people as red line because they are very, really powerful, have uh, militias, like Had al Amri, Faisal Tazali, then it was really uh, normal people burning their photos and shots against them. Mm -hmm. When the Sadrists tried to hijack these demonstrations and tried to be a leader, he was faced by a criticism by the people themselves who were with him in the area because these people they didn't want a leader, which was something a challenge that they faced. Because whenever any government tried to approach them, there was no leader to. Uh, talk to. No one uh, risked to be a leader because he was either to get assassinated and also uh, it was hard to gain all the Oh, it looks like uh, Oh, sorry Mustafa you, you, you froze for a little bit there mm. um, uh, but if you, you could we, yes I can if you could just wrap up kindly because we're going to move on to audience questions thank you Mustafa Okay, yeah, so now after uh, lots of people died and after the Shia authority demanded the government to resign, uh, the American government had resigned and there was many challenges until they figured out with settlement to get most of Academy into the position. And now the, what they are, the uh, protesters were they're, they're doing now with most of Academy uh, already approved early elections, they are trying to organize themselves with political parties and uh, participate into, into the elections as representatives of those protesters. Uh, at the same time, it's not, I don't think, the personal opinion is gonna work because all these parties are right now sponsored by the old politicians, the old parties. Uh, so I don't think they will, uh, in the near future, we will have some political party that will represent those protesters. Great. Thank you, Mustafa, so much for taking us through all of those fascinating details and the difficulties in Iraq. Um, I'd love to move on to audience questions. We don't actually have any yet, um, but I would just like to prompt the audience to please ask us questions by um, using the questions feature. Uh, and I also would like to sort of ask a, a general question of the panelists. Uh, maybe Ismail and Ines, because uh, Mustafa, you may have touched on some of this. So if we could talk a little bit about how people are actually mobilizing specifically today, whether that's in country or online. And then also maybe if you could talk about the diaspora movement too and, and the role that they're playing in any form of mobilization or expressing dissent. Maybe Ines, we can start with you because we haven't heard from you in a while. Sure. 
Um, so, I mean, obviously the um, COVID-19 pandemic has put a stop to the movement, um, well, since March 2020, but the movement is now back on the streets for like the past couple of weeks. Um, so we're kind of not back to the way it was initially, but, um, but the movement has certainly um, revived and the diaspora was also quite um, involved from the very beginning. There were a number of um, massive protests in, in France where obviously Algerian diaspora is, uh, is quite present, but also in Switzerland, in, in Belgium, in Canada. Um, so the protest movement also um, happened here. Um, the difficulty is that Algeria um, can be back on the streets now, they're back on the streets, but the situation in in Europe or North America is still quite, um, yeah, there are still like restrictive measures in place. So we haven't really seen that. But um, from the sort of like Algeria versus diaspora or Algerians abroad perspective, I think an interesting element is that the Algerian authorities have tried to sort of play, um, play with the role of the diaspora uh, because they're let's say they're quite big on, you know, saying that there is like foreign interference and, you know, that everything coming from abroad is aimed at undermining stability and so on and so forth. So it makes also, let's say the, situ the, um, the situation and the standing of the diaspora a bit difficult in the sense that sometimes they are seen as yeah, the ones like mingling with the West or um, trying to undermine stability or spark certain things in Algeria. So it's, it's, it's let's say it's a difficult position to be in. And one recent example of that is that um, recently the authorities announced that they were preparing uh, a draft law that would allow for uh, dual citizens to be stripped of their Algerian nationality should there should they be accused of acts of terrorism but also very broadly defined acts such as undermining state security and and whatnot and we've al already seen a number of activists on the ground who faced such accusations so you know with this kind of things you also see how the authorities are also trying to undermine the role of the diaspora and the role of um, Algerian, um, let's say, dissidents and, and protesters abroad. Sure. Ismail, do you see any commonalities there or differences? Sure. So since the fall of, of Bashir's government um, and then the creation of this transitional uh, government, um, some of the activists that were involved in, in organizing the protest uh, have become a part of the civilian side of the transitional government. Um, but there's still concern, um, I think, on the street. Um, how successful um, will this transition be? Will it be allowed to actually uh, transition into a, a true democracy? Um, 39 months is what the uh, various political parties, uh, various actors, let's say, uh, agreed upon between the civilian forces, between the uh, military. Uh, but also there's concerns for remnants of, of the old government. So you can say that the, the quote-unquote street has been something of a watchdog um, with, um, you know, something that came out with, with the uh, Sudanese revolution are the Lijan and Muqawama, the uh, resistance committees that, that are based in neighborhoods that have been um, taking to the streets here and there at, at different periods when they see something that um, that uh, they, they feel that they need to protest. Um, I think uh, in, in the past year, the, the issue with the pandemic, with the economic uh, situation um, uh, has been a reason uh, for discontent. Um, there are those who also see, are critical of, of, of the, uh, the new prime minister's handling of the, the transition, uh, Prime Minister Hamdok, Abdullah Hamdok. Um, and, um, you know, calls, you know, that the revolution had particular slogans, Riyya Salam Wa Adala, freedom, uh, peace, and, and, just, and justice, Tuz uh, good bus, you know, must fall, that these slogans have not yet been uh, achieved. Um, there are, I think, uh, 
some pro progress in certain areas, uh, whether legal reform or with uh, a peace agreement with different armed rebellion, uh, armed rebel movements in, in the country, particularly from Darfur and the Nuba Mountains. Um, but um, they're still concerned that, again, the, you know, the, the biggest fear in, in among Sudanese is the repetition of uh, an Egypt-like situation where the, the military uh, comes in and, and takes over, uh, that the economic situation, uh, a bad economic situation becomes an excuse uh, for seeing the mishandling by the civilian uh, side. Uh, this is not to say also that the civilian side is not without its own shortcomings. You know, we, we're seeing old divisions of, of politics coming, you know, resurfa resurfacing among the civilian uh, forces themselves, um, the catering to different regional forces. Um, so these these are, I think, some some of the concerns. But also, I think, in terms of organizing, when when you speak to activists, um, a, a major concern I think is cybersecurity today. Um, given um, the uh, again the regional context, given uh, the the possibility of normal you know full fledged uh, normalizing with with Israel, uh, the concern of what kind of uh, role that um, cybersecurity companies, uh, especially Israeli ones, that might 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 play in role with with what with whatever connection that you might have with authorities uh, in in Sudan. Uh, the idea that um, you know the uh, you know quote unquote fake news, um, looking at you know websites, Facebook pages um, that are either promoting uh, anti-transition, anti-civilian forces, uh, supporting maybe um, the old government. These these are some of the concerns I think that uh, many activists will tell you that uh, they're, they're very worried about uh, today in Sudan. Sure. Um, I'd also love to ask sort of more generally, um, what opportunities do you think exist for future mobilizations in each of the different countries? I know Mustafa, you've touched on this, but if you'd like to elaborate or if any any of you would like to comment. Uh, yeah, as I was saying, the new generation right now, what we have noticed, like I've observed the older movement since 2011 until now, uh, this new generation is much, much different than any old generation that the country had. Uh, these people, they don't have any uh, right, li right lines when it comes to demanding their right. They, uh, and the most, uh, most important thing, they don't have anything to lose. Uh, people who are, uh, like, they were educated, educated, but yet they can't find any job opportunities, not in the public sector or the private sector. Because of the corruption that is all over the country, uh, they can't find any job. Those people had nothing to lose, and yet, they are armed with the education and with uh, with the open up, open up to the whole world. Uh, I, I believe in the next five or ten years from now, we will we will have some really change. We will have some like a light on the end of the tunnel. And in this country, when it comes to demanding their rights and having a decent uh, life and decent state, because of the new generation. Uh, there's some optimism here, which is great to hear. Ismail and Ines, do you share that optimism in your respective countries? I think I think one concern, I mean, there are a number of issues. I mean, I'll, I'll come back to the issue of cybersecurity. I think that is uh, really a big concern right now, I think, among activists. Uh, um, what kind of the role of surveillance, uh, what kind of connections do people in authority have with um, circles, companies um, that might be promoting uh, greater surveillance. Uh, um, that's one issue. Also, the, the idea of the return of remnants of the old government, you know, in 2020, in early 2020, there was a, uh, a attempted coup by uh, remnants of the old government. There was an assassination attempt on the uh, new prime minister. Uh, so the role of um, those connected to the old government, um, I think, is, is something that many people are worried about. And given the economic situation, again, in, in the pandemic, uh, these become uh, issues. Um, I mean, given, you know, Sudan has been ruled by Bashir's government for 30 years, by 
uh, an Islamist uh, uh, government. Um, the idea of the diaspora returning with new ideas, particularly from the West, from the US, from the UK, um, and what that means for um, various freedoms uh, and reintroducing introducing new ideas, I think is something that uh, you know, will we'll take time uh, at best uh, for people to get accustomed to. Ines, would you like to comment as well on how you feel about the future? Yeah, I mean, I think in all honesty, um, COVID-19 was actually a blessing for the authorities because it sort of put a stop to everything and we don't really know what would have happened um otherwise and now that the protests are sort of back for the past couple of weeks i think it's going to be very interesting to see um to see how events are going to unfold and obviously it's hard to know uh what the future holds but as as was highlighted by um by mustafa and ismail like the, it's a different generation i was talking about the civil war earlier well when the hirak movement started like 40 percent of the algerian population was actually born after the civil war um which ended 20 years ago which is kind of crazy so you see you see also how the youth um and how this new generation has been really prominent in in this protest and today we have I think about um, um, half of the population, which is around 42 million, that's actively using social media, and that's not something that was was the case, you know, several several years ago. So I think also the online space provides like a, a renewed opportunity for people to express themselves, and as was highlighted by um, by other speakers also created a space to say things that we did not really dare um, to say before. And it has created also an alternative to, you know, state control media and the official narrative. So I feel like we have a lot more tools today to, to play with. And um, so I certainly hope that that's, um, that's reason to, to be hopeful. We certainly see some commonalities there with countries across the region. Thank you for sharing in us. We do actually have an audience question um, from Philemon. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, Philemon is asking, what has the role been of the regional or international community in support of protest movements or otherwise? Anyone can answer that. It's addressed to all three of you. Ismail, you uh, look like you want to speak. Sure. Yeah, I, I was going to say this. I mean, uh, the diaspora, you know, has had played a big role in, in, in the protests of 2018, 2019. Um, uh, whether the international community um, role in Sudan, particularly, I think, was, was significant in mediating um, the agreement between uh, civilian forces, um, various civilian forces that were. Uh, uh, be, had created a coalition um, uh, during the revolution uh, and the uh, tr uh, what was then the uh, transition military council. Uh, so, so the African Union, um, the uh, the EU, the United States uh, involved in, in the mediation. Now, um, I think at a, a less, at maybe at an NGO level, uh, an activist level, you did you did see some. Um, uh, assistance uh, uh, by activists, uh, by different NGOs, in in, in uh, helping some of the, uh, uh, particularly in, in, in the in the uh, cyber world, uh, in terms of how to uh, overcome blackout, uh, et cetera, et cetera, um, or in in terms of of uh, connect, you know, connecting to media, to the international media. Um, uh, but uh, there is, there has been definitely, uh, I think, a, an official role uh, by the, the big regional uh, organizations um, and, and some of the governments to see uh, a, a transition in, in the country. Great. And uh, Mustafa, you were going to say something. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, even though, like, during the recent demonstrations, uh, all the EU embassies and the US embassies, other all condemn, uh, issued a statement condemning the using of violence and force against protesters. Yet it never stopped and uh, it, uh, it didn't help. And, uh, and uh, Iraqi protesters have criticized many, many times 
Janine Blaskar, the, the UN uh, uh, representative in, uh, in Iraq, because the, according to what, they, what they're saying, that she uh, all, all she's doing is she's meeting with those politicians, those who are killing Iraqi people, and yet they are not doing anything. But for the Iraqis, they have no hope with any regional or international uh, intervention or assistance or solidarity into their case because uh, according to them, the last time that the international community wanted to do something about their lives, uh, it's bring them what's came, what came after all three. Sure. Um, I'd like to turn a little bit to civil society. I know, Ismail, you touched on, the, on, on that, but perhaps, Inas, you can talk to us a little bit about civil society and its role in, in Algeria. Sure. Um, I think two years on, like, there's been really, like, a, a massive emergence of not necessarily civil society organizations, like, in an institutional ways, but but movements that have done like an incredible job, um, especially when it comes to documenting the crackdown. Um, for example, mentioning the the committee for the for the release of detainees. That's basically documenting, monitoring uh, pretty much on a daily basis, you know, releases, uh, new arrests, and so on and so forth. And that's something that didn't exist before but we've really seen that two years on like there's been a number of civil society actors that that weren't there before and and emerge and are doing all this work um documenting obviously in addition to you know ngos that were that were already well established in algeria but we really see that it sparked um it sparked like quite loose movement of civil society actors that have sort of tried to 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 help out and and denounce um these abuses and i also want to say a few words about the role of algerian lawyers because we don't necessarily think of them when we say like civil society we think more ngos but they have done an outstanding job um to defend journalists political prisoners uh, i'm sure everybody has seen these photos of, uh, you know, the defense committees of of journalists with like a group of 15 lawyers, um, all doing like, you know, pro bono work. And I think they've really played an absolutely essential and incredible role to also try to defend um, yeah, people who were unjustly arrested before court. So they today also like deserve quite some credits because you know they're fighting kind of behind the scenes in court and uh, they have played like a really um, important role as well. Thank you, you read my mind. I was actually going to ask you about that. And this is a fantastic segue um, for, for my follow-up question, which is about journalists in the region. And obviously Ismail and Mustafa, you are both journalists and the risks are very, very high for journalists covering some of these countries and communities. And uh, obviously it's different for local journalists versus foreign reporters, or if you're reporting from the diaspora as well. So perhaps each of you could comment a little bit on the role that journalists have played in, in the past few years in, in your respective countries. Uh, well, in, in Iraq, uh, uh, at the beginning of the demonstrations in the country, the Iraqi government has shut down the internet totally uh, to the country in order to ban any uh, live broadcast or any news that's coming from the squares. Uh, I gotta say something about the courage of the local journalists here in, in, in Iraq. They, uh, they were going, risking their lives in the middle of the snipers in, in order to get some uh, footage, live footage or like General footage, and then go with the. Each one has his own way to getting internet access, whether it was a vegan or uh, uh, SIM cards for, uh, from outside the country that can uh, bring the internet. And we manage all all that time to keep the footage and the news uh, live and updated day by day, even though the shutdown of the internet from all over the country. Lots of journalists have lost their lives covering these events. Lots of lots of journalists are still missing, actually. Uh, because of covering these demonstrations. Uh, I, I know lots of my friends who fled the country, either to Turkey or to, to KRG or any other country, and they're not, they're not gonna come back because they were threatened, their families had been threatened, uh, their lives uh, simply has over. 
in, in this country, life, their lives have been over and now they have to start all the way from, uh, from zero again. One of, uh, of the local photo, a photojournalist, a uh, friend of mine, who was the main one, he, he, was, uh, he stayed in the square for almost a year. He had his tent and he was going all the time with his cameras, taking some uh, photographs and live footage and then sending the SD card to anyone who knows in order to get them uh, air and live. Now this person is in Turkey and now he's, uh, he sold all his cameras and equipments in order to be able to pay the rent because he lost everything uh, when it comes to this country. Indeed, there's some remarkable bravery across the region when it comes to journalism. And of course, we see similar dynamics in other countries where journalists are routinely attacked and detained, such as in Egypt and, and Syria and elsewhere. Um, Ismail, what, what comments do you have in this respect yourself? So during the revolution, I mean, the, the government of Bashir had cracked down on local journalists trying to cover. Um, there were only a few uh, foreign journalists in the country, but just generally there was a significant crackdown um, in allowing journalists to, to do their job or uh, blocking the, the internet. Uh, many of the international journalists that, uh, that come to Sudan usually come from the two major uh, bureaus in the region, either in Nairobi or Cairo. Um, they were not offering visas at the time. Uh, but since the fall of the government, of Bashir's government, you, we do see uh, improvements in, in the uh, um, in, in media coverage, whether locally uh, or in issuing visas for, for international journalists to come. I mean, just watching Sudan TV today, um, I think that this kind of discussions that happen were discussions that you would never have imagined um, to happen in the country um, um, about, um, you know, politics in the country, about foreign relations. Um, I think there, there is a movement, but there's still uh, much that needs to be done, I think, in terms of training. Um, um, you know, media, local media in Sudan has historically been tied to uh, political parties, to, uh, you know, a kind of direction. And, and the training needed, the improvements, the reform that's needed, I think, uh, is in the process. Uh, there's still ways to go. Uh, but there, it's easier today than it was, say, two years ago. Uh, go or before. Indeed, we see that sort of politi political polarization and, and state-run media dynamic as well across the region. And there's always that tension with citizen journalists and independent journalists as well who, who routinely face um, difficulties in the work that they do and often end up in exile, as, as Mustafa has mentioned. We're, we're approaching the final um, 10 minutes of the talk, this remarkable talk today. And I'd love if um, each one of you could kind of either give some form of closing remarks or answer this question. I was really hoping that Aline would join us again, but it seems she might not. But she did reference lessons learned in how to mobilize in Lebanon from 2015 to 2016. And I'm curious what lessons you think were learned with the different movements, either within the countries that you're specialized in or, or other countries across the region. Um, and if you could talk a little bit about what what you've witnessed and what you think we could learn from these different movements and, and countries, maybe we can start with you, Ines. Um, unlike other countries, I feel like Algeria is still at the very early stages of learning and figuring out what's next. So I'm going to turn my final comment into a question to Ismail, actually, because I think we're all looking at Sudan with, um, you know, big eyes and trying to be like, how did you guys do it? Um, so I'm not gonna, yeah, go into any lessons learned because I think it's it's still quite early, but I'm very curious to hear from the other, you know, positive, I'm sure you can disagree with that to, to some extent, but relatively positive experiences and, and what you've learned from it and what what you could, um, you know, recommend or give us any tips in that regard? Right. So, I mean, the big question right now in, in Sudan is, uh, will this transition succeed? Um, and, and really at the heart of that um, is um, the agreement that was made between um, the forces of freedom and change, which represented a coalition of civilian groups and the, the, the military, um, is negotiating with the military uh, a, a means forward. Will the military at the end of the day um, 
uh, you know, uh, be true to its promise of allowing a transition? That's the big question. And that uh, is still, I think, on the minds of, of many Sudanese. It's been back and forth, I, I think, uh, uh, looking at how uh, politics has been played, I mean, in terms of who really uh, is running Sudan, uh, in terms of um, economic policies, in terms of foreign relations. I mean, the, the, again, the, like the normalizing with, with Israel um, uh, it was was a, a big question about who really is in control in, in, in Sudan. And so that I think is, but, but I mean, Sudanese definitely, I think, uh, with the 2019 revolution, have learned lessons, of, um, whether from uh, regional mobilizing um, from the you know the 2011 um, Arab Spring uh, protest, or from their very own history of the 64 October revolution, or the 1985 uh, April uprising. Um, uh, but but that 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 is the question: uh, Will will the military? Uh, um, uh, allow for a transition into a civilian government, and then the other question I think is, which is, is also important, will civilian forces, uh, uh, you know, the, the kind of division um, that exists between various civilian forces, will it allow uh, for uh, democracy? I think the, the question really is, and, and this is my own critique, I think, of uh, you know, looking at Sudanese politics uh, since independence is the, the very lack of the culture of democracy itself. Everybody says that they want democracy. Uh, but every military coup in the history, modern history of Sudan had been supported by one political party or the other. Uh, you know, the idea that politics is a zero sum game, that I get my way or um, if I don't get my way, that I support a military coup uh, to come to power. I mean, is this the end of that kind of politics? Uh, this has been, you know, a theme in, in Sudanese politics since 1956. Um, today, I think, uh, with 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 the uh, with uh, the incorporation of the armed rebel groups into um, the, the uh, a, into the new government with the Juba peace agreement uh, that was made uh, last year, um, d d you know, is this an end to? Uh, um, uh, discontent uh, in in the peripheries of, of Sudan. Um, this, uh, you know, there 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 are more more than one group who have guns in the capital today. Uh, will they manage to to help transition? Um, it's you know it's there's ups and downs, uh, but again, you know, um, I I think at the end of the day is you know keep. Your, your one's eyes on the prize, eyes on on the ball, and uh, you know hope that this, this actually works out. Um, that's that's you know I think um, the, the the best that any one one can say is that you know there's still uh, ways to go, uh, but um, it's not it's it's the end of the first half if you want to use a soccer football analogy. You know we're still in the second half. Will we reach the end or not? Thank you, Ismail, for those remarks. Uh, Mustafa. Well, uh, just like what Ismail said, now the the challenge of the, now the protest has in the street has ended. Now they are mobilizing themselves into political parties to participate into the elections that will be held next October. Uh, the, expect, uh, the expectations is that they will get from 10 to 15 seats in the United Parliament out of. 328 seats. Uh, they will have a voice. It's not going to be loud, but they will have a voice. But this voice will come as a result of hundreds of people died in the street. The main, I think, the moral responsibility that's on, on them is to represent these voices well. Uh, because unfortunately, what we learned covering these demonstrations is uh, within the Iraqi government, Iraqi life doesn't matter. I mean, it's been more than a year, and until now, they haven't made a list, a total, a full list of those people who died uh, in the, to the demonstrations. Uh, they, uh, now they are forming these parties. They, they want to be as oppositions into the parliament to represent the uh, demonstrations. Uh, I think the, the main challenge for those people is right now is how to make their voice will be heard. 
Thank you, Mustafa. And if I may just make a couple of comments on, on Lebanon, because uh, Aline, unfortunately, is not with us. I mean, personally, because I'm Lebanese, my own analysis is such that we are at um, a real um, breaking point in Lebanon. If not, we're, we're beyond the breaking point. We're beyond the brink. I mean, if we look at the dynamics that led to the mobilization in 2019 and the desperation that caused the people to, to take to the streets, then it's in fact far worse now than it was then. I mean, the bulk of the country is living in poverty. If you look at basics like food prices, if you look at the continued impunity of the, the politicians and the political elite, you know, the lack of justice, lack of accountability, certainly the COVID situation also worsened the economic situation and also the pure mismanagement of the COVID situation. There was a huge spike in COVID um, uh, infections and, and uh, deaths. Uh, in, in the first month of the year, given that the Lebanese authorities decided to completely open up the country uh, against all logic at the end of the year. And then, of course, the culmination of all of that government negligence and, and corruption with the Beirut blast. Um, my feeling is that it's only a matter of time until we start to see mass mobilization again in the same way that we witnessed in 2019, given how desperate the situation is and what the Lebanese population, and not just Lebanese population, but um, the refugee population in Lebanon is currently facing as well, as well as migrant workers. So it's only really a matter of time. Um, hi, May. Uh, we are drawing to a close. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone so much for speaking. I've learned a lot today and really appreciate uh, the invitation from Tim App as well. Thank you, Zahra, for moderating what has been such a fascinating conversation. Thank you, Ismail, Mustafa, Inez, and Aline for your insightful comments and your valuable time. Aline, we're so sorry we lost you, but we will find another way to bring your immense expertise to our audience in a different forum. To our audience, thank you for your participation and your questions, and to the team here at Time Up who made this event possible, thank you for your efforts. Today's event, like I mentioned earlier, is the final as part of Time Up's 10 Years On project, which we bring to a close uh, later this month. Through this project, we have been privileged to host firsthand accounts and dynamic analysis on a range of topics and countries across the region in both Arabic and English. Um, topics as, as diverse as how the open data movement has been mobilizing in Lebanon to how the Syrian regime has weaponized cyberspace against organizers even today. We've hosted three other events prior to this one that have reached hundreds around the globe, and we've put together a deeply personal multimedia project speaking to advocates in exile. While the project comes to a close next week, Time Up will certainly continue to engage around these themes raised throughout it. My gratitude again to everyone who has made this project so unique in our space, and I wish each of you a wonderful rest of the morning, day, or evening, no matter where you are. Goodbye, and thanks, everyone.